Well, you know what tomorrow is. It's the least suspenseful Super Tuesday in the history of Tuesdays. But nevertheless, it's a Super Tuesday. Trump is going up against Nikki Haley. Are we still saying that? I don't know. Let's ask Sean about that. Joining me now, host of the incredible Sean Spicer show right here on the first TV, Monday through Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Okay, Sean, before we get into the super suspenseful and highly competitive Super Tuesday, can you explain for the layperson what is Super Tuesday? Why do they even call it that? I know we all just pretend. I don't even know what is this day. So it actually goes to the party rules. Uh, there are certain um, ways that you have to allocate your delegates, both in terms of timing and proportionality, according to, at least on the Republican side, their rules. And so a lot of states who want to be more relevant, if you will, there's a provision for carve-out states. We've seen those go first, Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, and South Carolina. And then this idea of Super Tuesday was states wanted to go earlier. Uh, they had to allow their their delegates to be awarded proportionally. If you waited till after March 15th, you could make them winner take all. They wanted more states to be part of the process, if you will, but they didn't want there to necessarily have a runaway candidate. So the idea of making them, you could go earlier, but they didn't want to set up the situation so that you would be able to run away with it under most cases. Obviously, for very different reasons, that's going to happen for Donald Trump tomorrow. Okay, Sean, can you explain to the average person, because I get these emails all the time, I know you do too, why can't all the states just have their primary on the same day? Why is there Iowa and then three years before New Hampshire and then Super Tuesday? Why, do, why does one state get a say or the why? Well, so let me just, two things that are important to understand. Up until 1972, the states had nothing to do with this. This was all delegates. Remember, I know this might seem foreign to a lot of folks right now, but political parties are private entities, right? We care about them because there's only two major ones in the United States. Then you've got obviously a bunch of minor candidates, minor parties, the Libertarians, the Green Party, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, legally speaking, these parties are, are clubs, they are entities. They get to decide the rules and after 1972, they started, primaries had previously just been beauty contests to show your political strength, but all the power was rested in the delegates from the states who went to a convention. Um, so why do we why do we not have uh, a one day of voting? Well, for the premier reason is because the parties don't want that to happen. And they're for a myriad of reasons. Number one is you don't want necessarily a national candidate, somebody who comes in maybe has huge name ID, uh, but you know, think about, some of the candidates that we've seen, you know, up and down the last few cycles, you want someone to come in, be able to meet the voters. I think about the people that have won Iowa, Rick Santorum, uh, Ted Cruz, Mike Huckabee. They were people that wanted to get to know voters, talk about their ideas, and then see if that campaign could take uh, fire, catch fire. Um, so the campaigns, the parties rather, have set up a system that allows candidates to prove that they have ideas to interact with voters rather than just be able to raise a ton of money or be personally wealthy or have high name ID. Um, so that's why they've chosen to do this. But the reason ultimately becomes the parties themselves have the right to dictate the process. Sean, okay, let's get to the boring part, to be honest with you, tomorrow. There's no suspense here. Nikki Haley just won the only primary she's going to win. It was in Washington, D.C., surprise, surprise. So there's no suspense for tomorrow night. What are we watching for when it comes to Trump? Whether or not Nikki Haley drops out, frankly, is inconsequential in my mind. But when it comes to Trump, should there be concern that in some of these states, most of these states so far, 30, 40, 50 percent of Republicans aren't with him yet? I figured that that, that coalition would be building faster, but maybe I'm crazy. Is that something he should be worried about? No, I, I get asked this a lot by the press. Keep in mind, up until, well, actually, it's through a few states tomorrow, these are what they call open primaries. You think about South Carolina, she actively encouraged Democrats and independents to vote in the primary for her. These people would never vote for Trump. They're Democrats. They just don't have a contest on their side. So pay attention to the amount that, that votes against Trump and where they're coming from. As I said, she's courting people because there's not a primary or a caucus on the other side that have nothing else to do but go in and vote against Trump. These aren't people that would ever be with him in November. I don't worry about them. There's a small slice that I think 
uh, are never Trumpers now. And when given the choice between Trump and Biden, we'll come back to Trump. And then there is a small slice uh, that probably won't vote for him. But I don't really care about them. I think there's a bigger problem on the Biden side when it comes to the black vote, especially younger black men, the youth vote, uh, Arab and uh and Muslim Americans in Michigan. Remember, Jesse, if you look at last cycle, 40,000 votes over three states made the difference. In 2016, it was 70,000 over three states. So we're playing on the margins when it comes to electorally winning the Electoral College, getting to 270. But let me let me go to the other point that you made. What are we looking for tomorrow? I will tell you how quick the candidates come out tomorrow to claim victory, because it's going to be a long night. But if Trump comes out at 8, 9 o'clock, that won't surprise me. If Nikki Haley comes out early and doesn't concede, that's going to be your tell that somehow she thinks that because she won the Washington, D.C. primary, she's got a mandate to continue and she has enough donor money from never Trumpers to continue. Tomorrow night, that's what we're going to be looking for. How early does Nikki Haley come out? If she comes out early and does not concede, then she plans on dragging this thing out. Sean, could you explain to me what I get out of it if I'm a big left-wing billionaire or maybe one of these right-wing billionaires who really dislikes Trump? What do I get out of blowing my money with Nikki Haley? I'm not saying that I have to become a Trump fan, but I'm a rich guy. I'm not talking about me. But I'm a rich guy. How do I gain anything by throwing away a million dollars? Right? These guys didn't get that way by throwing away a million dollars. What, what do they gain? Yeah, it's a great question you're asking because I keep thinking to myself, how rich would I have to be? And I'm a pretty yeah. cheap guy where I would give $100 or $1,000 on an effort that wasn't going anywhere. The answer to your question, the best that I can figure it, at least on the Republican side, are there a lot of these folks who want to be able to go tee off with their buddies at the country club and say, I did everything I could to stop Trump. I gave a million dollars to Nikki's super PAC. I gave a million dollars. You know, to them, this is the way of feeling like they've got a clean conscience when they go to the dinner party or tee off at their country club and they can tell all their liberal friends and their family members, I did my part. You know, I now I can tee off. Sean, let's talk briefly about these changes at the RNC. Obviously, nobody watching is going to shed any te tears for Ronna McDaniel being out. Doesn't even matter if you like her personally. Her record is simply abysmal. So now there's going to be changes. It looks like Trump is obviously going to have a heavy hand in those changes. Laura Trump talking about running for key positions and whatnot. And I understand that that's pretty customary. He's the most popular Republican in America. He's also dreadful at choosing personnel, yourself excluded, obviously. Thank Do we you. want Donald Trump staffing the RNC? I, look, I, I, I want Trump to secure the border. I don't want him making any staffing decisions. I, look, in fairness, it's a good question. Um, here's what's happening, though. So Rana is stepping down. And then Michael Watley, who is the current general counsel and chairman of the North Carolina party. So he's done very well as the chairman of North Carolina would ascend to become the new chairman, the co-chairman of the party, which largely is a is the chief surrogate of the party. Right. They go out, they help raise money, they help support the efforts of the chairman would now become Laura Trump. She's the only candidate that would be announced. And then Chris LaCivita, his senior advisor, who's been around D.C. forever. Chris has been a longtime political handy, he worked for Ray and Paul in the past. He's got a political firm, um, been very involved in federal elections for quite some time, will come in. Here's what I would argue. I think that this is sort of, you remember during the Iraq, the first Iraq war, Colin Powell used to have a saying, it was like, I think they called it the, the pottery barn. You break it, you own it. Right now, in my view, Trump owning the RNC is a good thing. He puts his people in there. If things don't get done, it's no one else's fault. He gets to take charge of the political entity that is responsible for putting the ground game together to helping to raise the additional funds necessary. So he might as well have control over it. That way in November, he either gets complete credit or owns the problems, right? But if it was still not his people, he'd say, well, I couldn't get the RNC to do what I wanted. So this way, he owns it. Normally, in, in past cycles, you would put in a deputy chairman, somebody who was the liaison and the consigliere to the campaign that was installed as an agreement between the presidential campaign and the current uh, leadership of the RNC. This time, I think Rana just decided, you know what, if you want to do this, it's all you. I'm going to get out of your way um, and you can install the people you want. The RNC is governed by what they call the 168. There are three members from every state, the chairman, 
the, the uh, National Committee man and the National Committee woman. And so Michael Watley, the current chair of the North Carolina Party, is part of the 168. He is part of the RNC, you know, leadership and membership. And that's who Trump has chosen. So my view personally is great. Now he owns it. 